I was drafted. And when you got the letter saying greetings, what was your reaction? What could I say? Here I'm coming. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you about that part. I had to go down to Buffalo for examination to make sure we were okay to be uh, enter the service. Went down there, I think, in July of 43. And uh, went down there and they had Navy doctors checking us out. And part of the cardiac review was going up and down after that cardiac review. Uh, the doctor said, Doug, you can have a, a heart murmur. I said, I've never known I had a heart murmur. He said, no, you can't come. I have to send you home. Came home and Dr. Shanahan said, yeah, Doug, do you have a slight murmur? We'll send you back in a couple more months. I went back in September. Army doctors, no stairs, no, st no cardiac check. Are you warm? I'm warm. So after that, on October 9th, 1943, about 20 of us got on the train, down the train station with bands playing and relatives there and got on that train from New York City. And we stopped at every milk stop along the way to New York, pick up more guys. By the time we got to New York, we had a full train load. Uh, we took the Queen Elizabeth, I think it was about five days. Nobody got seasick. There was 20,000 people on the Elizabeth. Uh, our whole division was 15,000. There were some Army nurses and some Air Force folks, but we were the bulk of the passengers. And of course, we landed in uh, Scotland. I had a pass to London while I was in England. And I was at a USO program in London, in which Fred Astaire was, was heading it. He was the main guy there. And he was going around uh, asking people who they were, where they're from, and so on. And he stopped and said, who are you? I said, I'm Doug Benson, Jamestown, New York. And a friend of mine's father in Jamestown heard the broadcast. Bill Hayes' father heard that broadcast. He called my folks. Doug's in England. He's in England. He's first part of September 44. Got to Utah Beach on September 7th. Basically D plus 90 at Utah Beach. And the Indian ship took us into about a couple hundred yards from shore, put us on a smaller boat, took us in about a hundred yards from shore. And we walked in. It was too shallow. So we land there at the beach at Utah, and nobody was shooting at us because the combat had moved on. So at that time, they put us on trucks. We, we spent one night in, in the tents at Utah Beach. And um, then they um, put us on trucks the next day and drove us down to Brittany. Utah Beach was Normandy, Brittany was the next province. And they took us down to two towns on the French coast on the Atlantic, Florian and Saint-Nazaire. They're both ports which had been submarine ports for the French Navy. But when the Germans took over France, they of course took over those submarine pens and they used them for their own subs because they had uh, entrance into the Atlantic without going through different seas and so forth. So uh, the Germans had these two ports filled with their submarines, and uh, there was probably about 60,000 Germans in those two ports. And uh, by that time, General Patton had captured Cherbourg, and we needed a port to bring in men and supplies. Captured Cherbourg and came right down the peninsula past Lorient and San Isaire and said that other troops can clean that place out if they want to. So that's how we got assigned to those two ports. And basically what we did, we did a lot of patrolling, artillery, we do a lot of bombing, artillery, and we also called in some uh, uh, Air Force bombers to bomb the two towns. And of course, th they were well pro provided because they had excess to come in there with their guns and men also. We also got some French underground young men to help us with the patrolling and to teach them how to patrol too. 
And this one time we went out with about four or five uh, French, trying to keep them quiet. And uh, we're going about, about a mile out toward the lines. We came back a different way by this farm. And the Frenchmen saw this pig in the farm there. So they went out there, killed the pig, put a wheelbarrow, and they also decided to come back a different route. They hit a mine, the pig, the two guys, the wheelbarrow. So they missed out on their pork, pulled pork dinner. <laughs> You're set up, but there's a tremendous snowstorm. And we're going a single line towards the Or Schultz. We knew there's a big tank trap on another road going into Or Schultz. And there we had to take a right turn. And uh, they had this big tank trap that was maybe 10 feet deep. The tank couldn't go through it. So we looked there and turned right to Window Orschels. The snow started coming down. And we stopped because of the snowstorm. And uh, pretty soon the, the lead fellows took off. My platoon was the last platoon. I was in the last uh, uh, unit of 12 guys uh, in this one line going into town, very last. So the uh, snow kept coming down with the front part of the line moved in. And one of the guys who had a, uh, he had a uh, fire, what do you call it, fire gun. He didn't see him move out. So they all moved out and the 12 of us never moved out. And this field was covered with little pine trees. So if you lay down, they couldn't see you. But we lay there all day in that snow getting shot at by artillery. We had two guys in our company that shot themselves to stay out of combat. One guy had a carbine, shot himself to the foot. I'm sure he's okay. One guy took a 45 caliber pistol, shot himself through the hip. If he's still living, he's still limping. How was your mental health through that process? Scared, like 99% of the guys. Before December, we captured a couple of uh, German, just regular soldiers, and we took them back to, they took it back, the guys who captured them took it back to our company headquarters. And uh, we wanted to interrogate them, but the captain said, no, we ought to send those guys back to battalion or regiment, let them do the interrogation. So these two guys jumped up and said, uh, we'll get a jeep, we'll take them back might be five or 10 miles back there. So uh, they loaded these guys in the Jeep. They took off, to, they knew where to go. In two minutes, they were back. What happened? What's going on here? Well, they tried to escape, we had to shoot them. I mean, Americans were not perfect. Yeah. It turned out that one of the kids, one of those two kids in the Jeep, just lost a brother in the Pacific. Okay, after that happened, uh, we crossed the Saw River. We were in a position over there where we were in a triangle, the Saw River and the Mosul. And up the head was Trier, famous, famous old fortress the Romans had. That was something. So we had to cross the Saw River to go to the Saar side, which we did in rubber boats because the bridge had been knocked out. Our uh, regular landing boats didn't get there. They got lost someplace. So we crossed those in air inflated rubber boats. That was a little hazardous too. But uh, once we got over there and we uh, covered action on a hill there, took over for some other guys. Why, well, uh, two of us got called up to the company commander's office. He said, fellas, I've got some uh, good news for you. Benson, you're going on a three-day pass to Paris. They gave us a haircut, gave us a shave, a warm shower, clean clothes, a warm bed, a nice hotel. And right in the midst of all these Parisian nightclubs, one night we're in this, uh, we, I'm talking about guys, in this 
Oh, and I thought, and uh, the lights went out. I thought it was kind of, kind of a raid going on now. But the lights went out, and all you could hear was giggling and squealing. <laughs> I came back out in a few minutes, but that was, uh, that was the excitement for that evening. They had decided to uh, have a big push for the Rhine River. We are about 100 miles from the Rhine, and uh, they were going to uh, have s several divisions involved try to break through the Germans and get as many as you could before they crossed the Rhine. So that morning, we had 40,000 rounds of artillery fire on these positions. We had aircraft bombing these positions. Because we're supposed to go 100 miles in 10 days, we might go 100 yards in uh, uh, three or four days uh, under normal terms. So with that preparation, uh, we took off, and uh, one of the fellows that wasn't killed at Orschel's was our first sergeant, a guy who was 47 years old. He didn't have to come up with us, but uh, he volunteered to come. And that first day, we were being shelled. We came upon this little creek, and there was a, a, a mill at this creek, and a stone mill house that we all got into. Well, the sergeant went up to look out this doorway and he got killed by a shell hmm. after not having to go. We headed towards a large city called Ludwigshafen. It was on the uh, opposite Mannheim on the Rhine River. And uh, some other division was trying to take it. They couldn't do it. So we did take it. We went through uh, the largest, we went through a plant that belonged to the largest chemical comp company in Germany, IG Farben Corporation. It had been bombed out by our bombers, but we had to go through all this equipment, Germans and stuff. And before we got that far, why we came across, there was about seven personnel, armor personnel carriers in a line outside this, this ritual. They'd all been knocked out. The guys are still hanging out of them. That whole line of seven got in somebody's sights. Office on the floor of the, the plant. And I went in there, and I heard these footsteps approaching, and I, there, was, there was no American swearing going on. There's no American terms going on. So um, there was a, a back door. I got near that back door, and it was, the building was divided. They came in through the front door. And uh, I thought, well, I've got to do something. So I threw a grenade in their direction. I don't know if they both got killed or not, but uh, they were going to follow me anyways. Well, since we had done our part, we led the 3rd and 7th Armies, the 94th Division, led those two armies to be the first one to dip in the Rhine River. And after we did that, the next day, they sent us back to a rest camp. They loved American cigarettes. They had to have American cigarettes. We used to get about a carton a week. I was not a smoker. I sold them to the Russians. 50 bucks a carton. 1945. My total pay was $95 a month. <laughs> so uh, that's the reason I, I, I'm 89 years old. I haven't smoked since. <laughs> From a joy standpoint, I had a, a pass into Pilsen. I was there when we had a, a VJ Day parade there, our 94th March there. And then we also had an opportunity to have a, a one-day uh, tour of Prague. Mm -hmm. the, the Russians were those sent a couple of truckloads in. People always ask me, you know, how, well, in fact, it's surprising it didn't come up this morning. Are you taping this? Yes. Yeah. Oh, how many did you kill? I told Shirley, I'm never going to tell you that because I don't know. You know, when there's a firefight going on, I might be aiming at you, but so is Joe Blow aiming at you. And who gets the credit for you? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, I'm not, it's not like uh, Saving Private Ryan where you're there and I'm boom, boom, you know, it's close. Nothing like that.
As far as medals go, <clears throat> you didn't ask me how many honor, uh, Medal of Honors I got. <laughs> how many? I got the most important ones called the Combat Infantry Badge, CIB. That's the most important for me anyways. And I got a Bronze Star, and I got, uh, uh, we had five campaigns in Europe. We were in four of them. We left France on uh, New Year's Eve, 1945. Yeah, because 46 came up. So then uh, we took this uh, uh, Colby Victory Ship. It's a brand new Colby Victory Ship. Held 1,500 people. I don't think anybody got out of the bunk for the whole 10 days. They're all seasick. Yeah, yeah. On the Queen Elizabeth, nobody got seasick. Mm -hmm. We'll stay in the Atlantic, North Atlantic storms in January. It was bad. So then uh, we landed in the States, went to Fort Dix, got my uh, uh, discharge, hopped on New York Central, and uh, got into Westfield about 10 o'clock. The place was closed except for one guy there. They said, where's the next uh, streetcar, JWNW? We said, it'd be about 8 o'clock in the morning. I said, this is my first night as a civilian. <laughs> <laughs> he said, sleep on the bench. He said, no one's coming in. We'll lock it up and sleep on the bench. So I slept on the bench. Welcome home, Doug yeah. Benson. <laughs> <laughs> next morning, first, uh, first streetcar back to Jamestown. Was it. Did your family know you were coming home? Yes, but not the exact date. I knew I was in the States. Yeah. So talk about, someday you knock on the, at some point you knock on the door and you, there you are. What's the reunion like? Cheerful. Well, your uh, grandson, Jacob, uh, wants us to ask a couple questions, and some which we've already answered, but... I answered the rest at home. Yeah. <laughs> Jacob wants to know, what's the, what's the food that you missed the most? What was that dinner when your family said, hey, Doug, what do you want to eat? I don't know what it was called in those days, but now it would be called surf and turf. Okay. <laughs> you went big. I like it. <laughs> With so few veterans of World War II alive today, and with fewer opportunities for these types of interviews, what would you like the younger generation to remember more than anything else about the effort made by you and your friends in World War II? Sort of the legacy question. Well, as I said before, we had to win. We're in a big war. These other wars, we're not in danger by anybody in Iraq or Afghanistan or what have you. We had to win this. We were being attacked. After uh, we got involved with uh, Japan, a day or two later, when Hitler was involved, we had to win. And the thing is, no matter what they tell you about how bad it is, you got to be there to see all these broken bodies and crushed skulls and stuff. You know, just coming green out of high school. And the other thing I made a comment too. People say, well, it's too bad you're in the Army, you know, in combat and so on. But one thing, almost everybody had the same problem. Between eight and t 18 years and 20 years old, we missed so much about maturing and growing up, about dating girls, about driving cars, uh, going to college. We missed that whole two years. <clears throat> and that's a big loss, too. <clears throat> 